What's up, guys? Welcome back to Rule of Two. I just said right. you take it away, and then I take it. Away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it, this is a team effort. This is a team effort, but we're very yeah. excited to have uh, Michael Stackpole here with us. Um, we're going to be talking about Star Wars, but also about your background in the video game industry, which is how I know you. Um, you have the amazing. Oh, um, you're good. You you actually worked on the game that I think has the coolest. Like, if I were to make a top five list about which video games have the coolest cover art in the history of video games, I would definitely put Wasteland up there as one yeah, of the top sure, five. Sure. You know, and for um, for the members of the audience that don't know what Wasteland is. Just Google it immediately um, because it was a game that I played on the Commodore 64. So uh, this is a 64-bit computer, um, which is like the equivalent of like a Hallmark greeting card nowadays, right? <laughs> and um, man, when 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 I hit run, comma eight, comma one. Um, on uh, on Wasteland, my life changed, you know? And um, I know this has nothing to do with Star Wars, but thank you so much for, you know, being a young man. I'm, I'm assuming you were early 20s, teens, when you worked on Wasteland? Uh, let's see, 87. Um, wow. I would have been, uh, well, 86, yeah, 85, 86. So I would have been just heading toward 30. Wow. And... and what, just just before we get kicked off here, because I know Theory has a lot of questions. I got a lot of questions. Oh, well, and as for the for the chat, he's also he's written. I'm going to pop up all of his books that he's he's written here, uh, including I Jedi, which a lot of you might know. Um, and he's also and there's there's a ton here. That's I mean, this, a lot. That's a lot. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of books. That's a lot of there's work, a sir. Ton of Star Wars books, ton of other books. And he's writing two new books right now, and one of them, which I'm going to talk about and pop up on the screen, the new Gears of War novel. And right. if you guys know me on the gaming channel, I'm a huge Gears head. I love that franchise, so be sure to check that one out. I will be. Mark, so, go for it. So my question to you is, what was it like working in the video game industry in the mid-late 80s? Because... I was lucky enough to be an early employee at Rockstar Games, so I saw that second generation of PS2, Dreamcast. You know, I was making video games during that gen, but I grew up on the Commodore 64 and the PC XT and AT and the 286 and the 386. What was it like being in that industry back then? Um, it was it was interesting. Uh, 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 Interplay had hired me as a freelancer. And hired a bunch of my friends as freelancers. Um, I worked uh, just uh, hand in glove with Alan Pavlish, who was the guy who programmed Wasteland, and um, it was really kind of uh, free form. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody was saying this is what you have to do. This was before the day when sound resources or graphic resources were so cool that they could command and 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 just move a game forward all by themselves. So we really had to have uh, some depth there to make make the whole experience work. Um, and it was, like I say, it was a lot of fun working with Alan because, uh, you know, another one of the designers would call me up and say, I want to do this and and we, we can't do that. And I would learn what it was he wanted to do. I would call Alan and Alan and I would have a discussion. We'd figure out how to make it work. And then I'd call the designer back and say, okay, this is how you code that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we just, you know, kept going through and improving the code and, and because it was such early days, there was no concept of things we couldn't do. Uh, you know, it was like, right. if, right. you know, if we can make it work, it works. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and with Wasteland, I mean, we really got the opportunity to, to just do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, and so, uh, that was, I mean, it was a thrill and, and, you know, boy, that game came out in 87, I'm thinking. I think it's, yeah, 87. I think so. Yeah. And, and so we're looking at over 30 years ago and, uh, uh, and I still have people like you guys who, who remember Wasteland, uh, I mean, just amazing. 
Wasteland, for the folks out there that don't know it, um, I believe was one of Electronic Arts' first games ever as a publisher. So EA, who, you know, it's in the game, you know, EA right. now, who owns the, 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 the rights to publish Star Wars games on console. Uh, back then, they were a small little publisher. And, and Wasteland, I believe, I'm not sure exactly where it falls in their history, but I do believe Wasteland is one of their first ever published games. Um, that I'm not sure. I know that uh, I do remember going to, they, they had a developers conference. And I'm I'm guessing it was. Oh my God! This game, dude! I had no. Is it? Is it this game? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah, it's yeah. Like. Holy yeah, that's crap! I didn't even know what the heck. Like that's. Look at that. Made cover, 19, dude. This was made 1988, so I was born 1990. So I remember playing this game. <sighs> I just I just remember I remember this dude right here perfectly. Yep. And I yep. remember these images. That's insane, Mark. I had no clue what the heck. I was like, this must be before my time. But, dude, I remember this game. Like, this I mean, is so cool. I'm sorry. Piece. I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. It was no, 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 no. No, but they, they had a bunch of, I remember with their conference, they had a bunch of game designers who were there. And, and it was cool because it was all uh, young people who were doing, uh, you know, really cool and innovative stuff because, again, nobody could tell you no. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and it was really kind of cool, you know, sitting there getting to know people, exchanging ideas, um, just watching it all kind of come together. Yeah. Um, got I got a question. Yeah, please, question. please, so, please. So jump into star Wars with, uh, you created the, obviously so many books and one of them I want to bring up is I Jedi. Right. Um, and we got a few people in chat and by the way, everyone who's sending super chats, we're all going to donate it to St. Jude's. Uh, I haven't put up a fundraiser that goes directly to them because you won't be able to comment. I think there's an issue with that. So I'll just take all the money and I'll, I'll put it in my pocket and I'll, and I'll send it to them. Um, you have a few fans, a few hundred fans uh, that are already thanking you for your work. Um, Ace says he wants to thank you for Corn Horn and Mirax, uh, the two of their, his favorite <laughs> EU characters. Um, with I Jedi, you bring up an interesting concept that I made a video on a while ago that you have to plug in lightsabers. Mm. Right. And you right. have to charge lightsabers. And this is something people don't know about. Uh, I didn't know about I, that. I would love for you to elaborate, you know, face to face. I, I'd love to learn more about that concept. Well, it was it it I I'm not necessarily sure it originated with me as much as um uh in West End games at the time had turned out tons and tons of official material uh, about the games. And so I remember in iJedi when I when I was boiling down to uh, time for Corrin to make his own lightsaber, because every Jedi, it's a rite of passage to, to make their own lightsaber. Um, whether I read it somewhere or it just seemed intuitively obvious that there had to be a power source, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's what I incorporated in there. I mean, I remember that whole, uh, that sequence of him creating his own, uh, uh lightsaber was you know as much a spiritual journey as it was engineering um and uh, uh and i remember i wanted the dual length lightsaber just because i always thought that was a brilliant concept cool. which as near as i know it came out of well the first time i saw it was in splinter of the mind's eye whether that was in the original script or that was something that alan dean foster came up with that i'm not sure i'll, I'll have to ask Al, alan actually um he was our but, first uh, first person we interviewed yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's a nice guy he lives here in Arizona, and and uh, they do Super not cool see guy. him often. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, but because it was so important, I thought it was it, it was incumbent upon me anyway to 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 get it right. Uh, right. And and in um, uh, in the Credit Trap, which was the third of the X Wing books, uh, Corin had pulled a lightsaber out of essentially a museum case. And I think it was Luke uh, made the comment to him afterwards. He said, you know, there were, cause there were other lightsabers in there. And, and Luke said, you know, the lightsaber you got was from your family. And it was the only one that was holding a charge. So, you know, and, and I guess that was okay by Lucasfilm because they never, they never said, no, no, we don't need batteries. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I always thought that was super cool because it's like these things are they're crystals and 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 then the whole concept with 
uh, are you, you're familiar with how the Sith made their crystals, right? Like the synthetic. Uh, not, not, no, because the Sith and then they changed it. around when I was when I had to That's when true. I had all this sort of stuff. That's true. So they they essentially would like they it was very spiritual for them too, but their crystals were not organic crystals that they would find on different planets, which were covered in legends. And now, of course, you know Disney wanted to change it, and they you have to bleed your crystal in order to make it red, which is a cool concept itself. But I like the old way. Um, but with the Sith, they would have these inorganic crystals that they would like Darth Maul, for example, in one of the legends comics and books, he would put it in a furnace. And he would heat it up and he would sit there and meditate all the, well, not meditate, because just don't do that. But he would pour all of his dark side emotions into sure. this crystal for days. And it was like this passionate thing. So I was always wondering how they charge their light, their crystals too. But right, uh, right. I, I guess they weren't around at that time. Yeah, but then again, you know, the, 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 it was always said that, you know, use your emotions and, and, you know, let your emotions go and it can charge things or, or yeah, yeah. make you more powerful. I mean, that was what the emperor trying to get luke to do so yeah. it could very well be that it is it is runaway emotions uh yeah. that the sith use to power their things whereas the jedi more ground their stuff which would be in keeping i think philosophically with both sides that's cool i like that wirelessly charging so the sith yeah. can wirelessly charge yeah okay so you you bring up a really interesting point that i'd love to dig in a little bit on so when you started writing Star Wars books, um, and I have to resist my temptation to go back to the video game stuff, but I will do that because we don't follow any scripts here on Rule of Two. So I will mm. go back to that because there's some fun stuff there. But you mentioned something that's really fascinating to me. Um, when you started um, doing your your novels, your Star Wars novels, the, right. way, the way that canon was informed was very different than it is now where there's entire departments and all kinds of stuff. And you mentioned something that there were no Sith back then. So how, how do you navigate that kind of stuff when you have questions about the rules of the universe back in those days? I, look, my degree's in history. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm used to doing a lot of research. So mm -hmm. think of this as a historic, think of the X-Wing books as historical novels. They're just set in the Star Wars universe. I love when, that. When I when I sent my manuscripts in, both for the scripts for the comics and uh, the novels, they were all footnoted. So mm -hmm. you know, if I needed a spaceship, I would go to the, one of the West End books, and and it would be noted in in a footnote. This is where I got that wow. uh, spaceship from. Or in in the case of some weapons, uh, I remember. Uh, I needed a, a shoulder launched uh, anti aircraft missile, and there was none. But it worked out in a West End product. They had a uh, they had a something something Mark One, which was a small missile, sort of like that. And then they had a Mark Three, which was something which much bigger. I needed something right in the middle, so I just called it whatever the Mark Two. And my footnote said, "This is why I'm calling it a Mark Two. This is where it fall. You know, if this is not going to be good, in, you know." This is not good for you. I can change it, but I need this to be able to shoot that thing down. Um, and and they and, were great. And when you talk about West End, um, are you talking about West End uh, and SSI's role playing game? Uh, yeah, the, the, the it was their it was their um, um, just regular role playing game. Yeah, so yeah, West End games. Had, they just had it's fascinating to me how much lore is actually originates like i don't know if people realize that how much of the expanded universe lore was actually first introduced in that role-playing game i know we we had um um we had uh darth maul on the show um and uh he, sam whitwer sam whitwer and right. uh he's a huge nut over that stuff and he knows all those little details down to like sure. some, some scientific like understanding of it yeah Look, when, when I got the contract for uh, the doing the X-Wing books, one of the first phone calls I made was to friends of mine at West End Games. And I said, look, I just got a contract to write four novels. Uh, I need one of everything. And, <laughs> and they, said, uh, they said, do you mind taking, you know, scratch and dents? Do you mind taking things we've had returned from, you know, the of scuff course. covers and stuff like that? And it was like, I will take anything. You know, you guys are doing me a favor. Uh, and, and that's why in, in the books, you know, I ended up thanking, uh, thanking West End Games for, 
for their generosity. But that was, you know, I think when I was doing those books, I had about six linear feet of source material, uh, you know, just between novels and and game stuff uh, to be yes. able to tear through. And then occasionally you'd have questions and, you know, I would write to my editor at Bantam. She would send it over to Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm would send the answer back to her. I would finally get the answer. And, and, and back then Lucasfilm was, because the continuity was still being solidified, mm. they were still discovering anomalies. And both, uh, both Tim Zahn and I, on, on different occasions, people at Lucasfilm said, hey, we, we noticed this anomaly. Can you fix it? Can you find mm. something that will, that will clear this up? And, and, and for Tim and me, it was a lot of fun to go through and say, okay, we can rationalize this. Cause I mean, that's what writers do anyway, but yeah, you know, yeah. it would, it would be, we're getting to fix Canon. Holy crap. This is so cool. Do, do, uh, do you have any example of that? Oh, uh, well the, uh, yeah, sure. The, uh, super star destroyer, uh, uh, that, uh, Darth Vader had, um, in the, uh, in the, in the source material, uh, there were two different shipyards that were said to build it. Uh, which is why in the X-Wing books, I didn't choose one over the other. It's just that there were two built. One was the executor, the other was Lusankia, and Lusankia was the one that, that uh, I started used. Um, and so that was critical to my, to my books. Um, but that solved that problem. You know, the rumors were, yes, there were two shipyards that did build a Super Star Destroyer. Only one built the ex executor. The other, you know, built the song here, So Cool. I love how you guys have to make up your own canon kind of just like, hey, you fix this. Fix this for us. Yeah, well, like, like I say, and, and you know, you know, for us as because we're just freelancers, you know, Lucasfilm calls up and says, in essence, hey, we trust you to fix this. Would you mind? That's cool. And it's like, nope, happy to do it. You know. Yeah. So. Yeah. When it's in, in hands like you and, and Tim Zahn. And speaking of Timothy Zahn. Uh, you and him worked together on a bunch of things, including Mara Jade's story. Mm -hmm. um, Mark, you were asking a question before we went on air, and I cut you off because I was like, "We got to save this." Yeah, want to ask like, it now? Yeah, so it's a it's several tiered question, but um, I'm a big Mara Jade fan, sure. and I um, I fell in love with Mara Jade because of the Timothy Zahn book, right. um, especially the way that they meet. And the dramatic irony involved in their meeting to sure. me always fascinated me that she knew everything about him and right. she had this hatred for him because he killed, you know, spoiler warning, he killed her, her, her mentor. Um, right. and, and Luke knows nothing about her, you know, but he starts to notice that she's actually knows how to use a lightsaber. And it was, it was this incredible uh, exposition of meeting each other. So long story short, I've always struggled with the overall rumor that George Lucas hates Mara Jade. Do, do you know where, where that got started? Is there, is there factual data behind that? What, what, what's going on with that? Is it true? I, I think that's just a rumor that has kind of crawled up through fandom for years and years and years. Uh, I know that, I know that uh, Tim met uh, George Lucas. They had a sit down conversation before the first book was done. I know mm. that, that as with any of the novels, everything is cleared through uh, Lucasfilm. And, wow. and, and a, a hundred percent for anything as major as a love interest being developed for Luke, mm -hmm. um, that's a decision that George would have given a yes or no on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I mean, I, 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 Tim and I have talked about, and I've listened to Tim talk about the conversation that he had with George. I don't recall Mara Jade ever having been been brought up specifically. But then again, you know, Tim, I I, I don't have a readout of the uh, uh, you yeah. know of that of that conversation. Um, but it's also um, especially in the early early days of the internet, where you had message boards and people would leave theories and they would say this and that. There were things that were treated as fact um, by someone's supposition uh, that that just flat out weren't true. I mean, I remember when um, uh, when I did uh, Dark Tide Onslaught, 
Uh, in in uh, Bob Salvatore's book, um, a Nagri bodyguard guarding Leah had been killed by the Yuuzhan Vong. So my book follows it up, and now uh, Leah has two Nagri bodyguards. Mm. Okay, um, and I named my Nagri bodyguards sort of similar to the way Tim did, and and in reality, all I did was I took a. a a Turkish English dictionary, uh, and I one of them I named Steel, and just slightly altered the spelling of the Turkish word for steel, and I forget what the other one I named. But someone on a message board <laughs> left this theory that I named my uh, Nagri sort of the way that Tim did, as a slap against Bob Salvatore. <laughs> because Bob didn't follow that naming convention. Mm. But I didn't want to name it exactly the way it was Tim's because I didn't want anybody to know that I was dissing Bob. Now, none of that is true. Right. Uh, Bob and I are really good friends, you know, uh, and, and, uh, um, and and same with me and Tim. Uh, but I didn't talk to Tim about what he did with the naming convention. I just looked at how he named his Nagri and, and figured I would do something close. Um, right. So, so there were tons of rumors that that people would pop up on the internet as if they were an authority, as if they somehow had inside knowledge, and those rumors never die. An inside uh, source. I've got an inside source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, to the to the point where it got ridiculous in certain cases. So, so, so yeah. the 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 Mara Jade character. Um, back in those days, uh, actually caught fire, right? She was, this oh, pop, you know, the hand of the emperor, a powerful Jedi, and Luke's love interest. And then, speaking of Timothy Zahn, you and Timothy Zahn got to collaborate on a series for Dark Horse Comics about Mara Jade. So what, what was that process like of you and Tim uh, figuring out this uh, comic book run for uh, Dark Horse? Oh, it was it, that was a lot of fun. Um, one, Tim and I had collaborated on a bunch of short stories that had gone into the Star Wars Adventure Journal, uh, which was West End uh, Games uh, magazine. We had um, his uh, Spectre of the Past and uh, Vision of the Future, and I Jedi are uh, they're really a trilogy. If you read yeah. Spectre, oh, wow. then I Jedi, and then um, Vision. You really get a trilogy sort of encapsulating Luke's growth as a Jedi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Tim and I were collaborating back and forth all the time. And um, I had been doing comics for uh, uh, for Dark Horse. And I knew from conversations that Tim really would like to do uh, some comics. He thought that would be a lot of fun. And so I said to my editor, let's do a six-issue Mara Jade miniseries. You know, I'll do the first three. Tim will do the last three, uh, and then Tim and I figured out what we would do for the uh, for the story. And you know, my job was to, you know, start Mara Jade off, escape her out of prison, and and uh, you know, uh, send her on her way. And Tim picked her up uh, from there, and and just continued it all, all the way out. So, so like I said, it was a blast. Would you have liked to have seen her story develop and, you know, maybe in the future in some show today on Disney Plus or um, in the sequels, perhaps? I would have loved to have seen her in there somewhere. Yeah. I, I think here's the here's the issue, I think, with all the sequels and with the stuff that's being done on Disney Plus right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, George had his vision and did his stuff in the first three movies and then the sequels. Um, people like Tim and me were lucky enough to be brought in and allowed to share our vision of what was going on in that universe. Right. Um, and now you've got a whole new crop of talent, both on the novel side uh, and then doing all of these great shows for Disney Plus that mm -hmm. are getting to to show their uh, – they're getting to do their iteration of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that if one of these new people – decides that Mara Jade really ought to exist and really should be in there and they really want to tell her story, I'm sure that Disney is, is going to be receptive to that. I mean, they brought Theron back. Yeah. Um, you know, in the same way Patty Jenkins is is going to be doing X-Wing stuff. You know, yeah. it's going to be her vision 
Um, and this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize. A lot of people who are really kind of sore about um, the fact that they didn't take Tim's books, so they didn't take the X-Wing books and, and bring them straight to the screen. Um, all of the people who are doing that stuff now are of an age to remember the West End games, to remember all of our novels, to remember all those comics. So that even if they're not using our material, a lot of those creators have our input anyway, you know, because mm -hmm. they were reading it as they grew up. Our stuff helped shape their vision of Star Wars. And, right. and Disney and Lucasfilm are being really good, I think, in letting them in letting them do that. I mean, I've been I've been watching the shows and 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 really enjoying them very much because um, it's it's cool to see what somebody else is doing to this stuff. Dude, yeah. I'm in love with the Mandalorian. Like it's oh, absolutely, it's, just, yeah. it's a great. Did you did you have any uh, uh, wind of the under under underworld show that George was going to make uh, before he sold to Disney? Uh, and it was correlated to the thirteen thirteen game. There was basically a, a he wrote fifty episodes or something. I rumors I, say about I, like an underworld coruscant uh, show, which I don't cool. have any. I don't have any um, input on that. I do know that that back in the day, so twenty twenty five years ago, uh, yeah. when you'd go to meetings at Lucasfilm or or talk to some of the people there. There always was a question of, wouldn't it be cool if we could do essentially the Godfather for Star Wars? Um, you know that that kind of uh, depth and and exploration of the villainous side of things. Yeah. And so I think that was always a, a project that they were interested in. And I, I think that you get to see uh, down through the years as the mediums change, uh, the way that we're going to express this stuff. You know doing the underworld in a game is going to be entirely different than doing it in the graphic novels or doing yeah. it in the novels or, or those things. And so it boils down to who do we have that is the talent that will do this? Who, who wants us to do this? Um, you know, cause if, right. yeah. you know, Del Rey as a publisher said, no, you know, we don't want, we don't want, uh, uh, you know, crime and, and uh, crime and punishment in star Wars. You know, they, they they wouldn't get it. And that's, don't anybody take that as me saying there they don't be yeah. crime and punishment. And, uh, and and someone at Del Rey said, no, that is not it. That right, was right. merely yeah. an example. To, yeah. to, uh, to take it back to Mara Jade for a little bit. Um, sure. When you and Timothy were jamming on the Mara Jade story, when you guys were just riffing inside your brain, how, how, how did you see the relationship, if any, between Mara Jade and Darth Vader? Um, you know, that's a, because we didn't really have the vision of the Sith as having only two and having mm -hmm. the rival, which would suggest in the cosmology that, that Mara Jade is sort of, a this, the, the, you know, Sith two and a half. You know, mm -hmm. the one that would replace Darth Vader or the one that would be the next one up, mm -hmm. you know, to use a baseball term, you know, they're the person, uh, you know, uh, uh, On the bench. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, 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 so uh, we didn't have to worry about that. You know, the idea that um, there were different types of force users uh, and that you could be trained in different ways um, when we were doing stuff that was open, uh, a, a lot more open. Um, so Mara Jade didn't present us as here's a proto Sith or here is a, uh, you know, here is a Jedi with no name, uh, kind of anti-hero. Um, it was just another force user that we were kind of exploring because we had thought after the clone wars, all this, all the Jedi were gone. Mm -hmm. And so now we can see them coming back. So, so there was never any riffs in the back of your head, like they they interacted like this. Because to me, if you look at it from today's perspective of uh, Vader's story with Padme, you could definitely see parallels with Luke's story with Mara Jade, and then it makes it even more interesting if Mara Jade knew Darth Vader in a like in a very kind of official, you know, like job kind sure. of way. 
and then ends up fall, falling in love with his, you know, with his son, you know? So um, anyway, it, 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 like it was just something that, you know, like, like I was imagining you and Timothy Zahn smoking a cigar back in like 1991 <laughs> with like no internet, lights are dim, drinking whiskey, talking about more. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, That's what theory and I do. That's what theory and I do. <laughs> okay. So, so, so Tim doesn't drink. Uh, it doesn't smoke, <laughs> so you would not catch it with whiskey and a cigar. Right, um, right. Me, I'll do the whiskey. I, I'm good for the whiskey. <laughs> you know, every five years I have a cigar just to remind me why I wait five years. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, th I think the way that, that we were kind of looking at it is um, the empire is kind of big to run, mm. uh, and so you know you've got uh, you've got Darth Vader and he's handling this set of problems. You've got Mara Jade, and she is more the Emperor's James Bond, right. you know. Yeah. Or, and, and she may not be, you know, the Emperor's hand may be one of a half a dozen agents, not all of them being, the, but you know, another one might be the Emperor's eye or the Emperor's ear. Wow! Uh, did you guys actually say that? Did you guys actually call them the eye and the ear? No, no. I'm just saying. Oh, okay, okay. Because you just blew my mind for half a second there. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, we sort of just had the sense that there may be others that are out there. Yeah, as yeah, well as enough. the unaffiliated individuals, the Jedi were in hiding that sort of thing. Well, there's the Emperor's hand. Well, yeah, yeah. So, Mark and, he, and yeah. the Emperor likely has two hands. So, yeah, so. <laughs> right, and the feet. Yeah, and the nose, and the nose, the Emperor's nose. Yeah. All right, that's, <laughs> that's, that's enough. enough on that. And then the toes and the yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, how? You you have a fan that is asking. Uh, his name is Big Red. He says, "How difficult was it to write Corin into the Jedi Academy trilogy after the fact?" Oh, that's that's a real good question, um, uh, and it was actually easier than would probably be supposed. Um, one of the novels I fell in love with when I first became aware of what novels were um, was Frederick Forsyth Forsyth's book, Day of the Jackal. And Day of the Jackal, he writes an assassin's attempt to knock off Charles de Gaulle uh, right in the middle of, you know, real, real life events. He's I mean, that was, time. yeah, I mean, and that was, that was, uh, uh, so that was very much of a uh, historical novel. And uh, when it came time to do I, Jedi, uh, I knew that this was, it was perfect just oh. to take the Jedi Academy trilogy and basically do a Day of the Jackal. So... Wow. Now what I, I had it. to do is I had to go through and outline that entire trilogy. So I had to know where every single character was at every single moment so I could make sure that only the right people were in the right scenes. And it was really funny. I mean, Kevin J. Anderson and I have been friends for a long, 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 long time. I was actually Kevin's first ever editor. Um, so cool. uh, when I did that, I uncovered a mistake in the continuity in the middle of the book and yet was able to fix it just because there were there were X number of, of apprentices. I mean, dozen in all. Uh, and in one scene, Kevin had just miscounted uh, and said oh. the sixth present, Corin would have been the seventh. And so I had Corin doing something else, which kept the count right for that particular scene. Okay. So it was a lot of fun to go through and, and, and you know, just... Because of a because of a mistake, uh, make it all seem like we had planned it for years. So we really That's cool. Had you're kind of like a puzzle master. You kind of figure out what piece goes here and there, and you got to see the whole map of it. Yeah, well, and, and that's what that's what makes it a lot of fun, you know. Um, not to jump, but to jump, I'd love to talk about briefly the Gears of War book you have coming right. out. Do you want to? Talk about that a little bit. When does it take place, and this and that? Sure, sure, sure. It, it takes place um, right after uh, the third game. Uh, okay. So, so uh, basically, you know, the the world is the world is attempting to recover from having been hammered uh, mm -hmm. repeatedly. You know, yeah. all the all the lambin is gone. All the all the bugs are gone. Um, you know, all the grubs are gone. So, so this literally is a a novel where there is peace and now they're really sort of faced with uh what are we going to do we don't even know how many people we have left and so it is it is very much of a uh rebuilding novel a uh, rediscovering novel of what's out there and for the main characters who have been spending 
their entire adult lives embroiled in combat. What do you do now that there isn't any more combat? Right. You know, and so and so it's very much of a uh, uh, not a, a not a coming of age novel, but a changing of life novel, mm. uh, especially for Marcus um, yeah. and uh, uh, and and she who will become his wife. Uh, so it it um, uh, and, and that was uh, I mean that was just a lot of it was it was really fun for me to explore that universe and and try and you know find all the little things that I can tie back together again and and uh, and also to to really uh, add more uh, emotional impact uh, to the story. I mean, I thought in Gears of War they do a really really good job with that. Um, uh, uh, you know, Marcus and Anya are, are both characters uh, that that are emotionally involved, and what happens with other characters, um, you know, it has that impact when characters die. Um, and here I was given the opportunity to go back in and kind of explore some of those feelings more deeply and watch people kind of handle that, deal with that sort of stuff. I was pretty torn up when Dom died. Exactly. And, and Very. This book, I mean, it takes place right after it. There's no way you can get away from that. And Marcus having to deal with Dom's death. Yeah. You know, um, cool. no. so since we're, jumping, it since we're jumping, I'm going to jump, jump, but I'm going to jump back in time. Okay. Um, because I think, and for all the video game nerds out there that love the history of video games, um, there's few games that I think are more seminal in the story of storytelling in video games than Star Trek, the 25th anniversary, um, which is, which I believe you were a designer on. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, which is amazing to me that your career, before you actually got into the writing, you were actually designing. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it usually goes the other way around, but back then there were no rules. Um, so Star Trek, the 25th anniversary, um, I think is a breakthrough moment in storytelling in video games. And then Judgment writes the sequel, I, I think is almost just as good. But back, back then, um, w was there any, like, did you use that as a springboard to get into the Star Wars stuff? Or, or how, how, how did you work it on two such, you know, opposing kind of franchises play itself out in your life? Um, the, 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 there's no direct arrow of impact. There's no easy dots to connect uh, with that, with that particular set of things. Um, uh, the, the impact that Star Trek had, you know, back when I was working with Interplay um, and we were doing the 25th anniversary game, we had decided what we wanted to do was to do year four of the original five year journey. Right. So that was our, that was our goal. And so that's what it felt know, like. Yeah. And, and, and that was it. I mean, we, we plotted the scenarios, you know, we pulled stuff uh, to, to give you things that are familiar, but to give it in, to you in a different way. Um, and I think that that gave me, well, one, they gave me my first taste of working with a, with a Hollywood property. Uh, and, and, and two really was my first taste of the impact that you have working with a property that inspires fans. Mm. You know, the fact that there are so many people who know so much stuff and there's there are people, you know, at, at Paramount who will say, no, you can't do that. And so you got to figure out a way to get what you want without violating any of their rules. So it was a good it was a good training ground for for learning how to how to interact. Um, the uh, the impact that that doing Wasteland and Star Trek uh, and those um, on my getting the Star Wars novels pretty much boiled down to this: Bantam had a twelve book deal with uh, Lucasfilm to bring out novels. Those novels started with the Tim Zahn novels. They were selling brilliantly. Mm -hmm. Bantam wanted to do more. Bantam uh, looked at, uh, uh, Bantam asked Lucasfilm for another, for another license. Lucasfilm said, nope, you know, we're going to run this one out and see how it works. Uh, so Bantam said, hey, how about we buy a license 
to the X-Wing computer game. Which is a brilliant game. Yeah. Well, absolutely. But but uh, they weren't sure. So they called me up because I already had a contract with them to do some novels. They One of their editors called me up and said, hey, look, we're thinking about buying uh, rights to a computer game property. What do you think? Because you've done computer games, you you know, gaming, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, geez, I really don't think, I don't think it's a good idea to buy a life <laughs> game for novels. No way. Uh, you know, I don't think computer gamers are really into reading novels. You know, it's an entirely different medium, you know. And so I, I walked them through why I thought it was a bad idea. And the editor at the end of the call, she goes, wow, that's really too bad because we were thinking about buying a license to the X-Wing uh, computer <laughs> game. And I said, oh, X-Wing, Star Wars, buy it. <laughs> uh, it was a no-brainer, right? Uh, and uh, and and the editor said, "Thank you very much. You know, we're 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 uh, uh, you know, uh, thanks for your input." Two months later, six in the morning here in Arizona, I get a call from my agent. She says, uh, uh, "Bantam just offered you four Star Wars novels." I said, "Yes," mm. and that was it. And that was the X-wing novels. And That's so. Awesome. Uh, and so had I not done the computer game stuff, you know, I never would have been the person that they looked at their list and said, oh, we can talk to him. Yeah. And then it was like, then they took took my advice, bought the license and, uh, and you know. What, one, one, one last point here for the, for, the, for the listeners out there. I know that the whole Star Trek, Star Wars thing, it's not either or, it's both and. They're both beautiful properties. If you want to experience right. the best that Star Wars gaming has, uh, I'm sorry, Star Trek gaming has ever had to offer, check out Star Trek, the 25th anniversary. Even if you just look at the videos on YouTube, the entire cast came back and reprised all of their roles. Um, and it's truly, truly a landmark moment in storytelling and video games. And I personally want to thank you for that. Because when I was a young kid at NYU, um, playing that game just to take my mind off of the stress of university, it, it, it inspired me to go into video games instead of going directly into film. Because you showed me what was possible with that medium in storytelling. And I think that we definitely took from that game when we were making Grand Theft Auto. Um, and people probably would never connect those two things. But if you follow the history of gaming, sure, sure. Star Trek, the 25th anniversary with all its voice acting specifically, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, Indiana Jones and the, Last, and the Last Crusade and Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis and Police Quest and Space Quest and all those games push storytelling forward. But it was Star Trek, the 25th anniversary that gave those characters voices. Right. Yeah. You can also say uh, Wing Commander, right? Uh, by Chris sure. Roberts yeah. also did that. But Star Trek, the 25th anniversary was a breakthrough moment with that. And so from me to you, thank you. You are more than welcome. And I think so, it, it, credit has to be given to uh, to Brian Fargo of mm -hmm. Interplay because he was the he was the guy who, who thought of using the original actors. And he was exactly. sort of the guy who brought me on the project. So. And people probably hear that and say, oh, who cares if they use voice actors? It had never been done before. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, it made it, and it made it real. It right. made it real because because up to that point, all of these games were voiceless. You were reading them. You didn't have the, the feel. But when you hear, you know, when you hear Leonard Nimoy voicing mm -hmm. Spock, all of yeah. a sudden, that's that's real. You, uh, feel like you're, you feel like Kirk. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It definitely makes a big difference, especially when you like. Imagine if uh, some of the like the old Star Wars game for Revenge of the Sith had Hayden's voice. I mean, I know the voice actor was great, but sure, it makes sure. a huge difference. Going forwards with um, Patty Jenkins' new series on Disney Plus, right? Uh, what would you? What are some of the things you'd like to see? Well, one, I, I think it's going to be a, unless I've missed a press release. It's just going to be. It's going to be a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a movie. It's He's... not not going to be a series. Bro, this is just a movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hold on. Roll back yeah. the tape. Edit it. All yeah. right. Ask the question again, theory. <laughs> yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't know. I no, thought no, it was no, a series. No, I'm no, like, well, why yeah. would they? Why would they make a movie? They would just. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They, They're into series that keeps them longer subscribed. But, anyways, what would you like to see for that movie? 
Um, you know, one, I, th I think I'm, I'm, uh, I've been really impressed by, uh, you know, what got said publicly about her commitment to making this a story about the pilots, that this is, you know, going back to uh, honoring her father, who's a pilot, mm -hmm. uh, and, and those things. So I, I like seeing that there is that emotional connection there. Right. Um, I also think that that with Mandalorian and with uh, the movies and those things, there is a really nice area for storytelling uh, mm -hmm. where you can have uh, Rogue Squadron coming in and doing really, really cool stuff and, mm -hmm. and obviously have the ability to spin characters out for submissions and, and, and those sorts of things. I mean, who's to say in her Rogue Squadron, there's not going to be a character like Corrin who has some Jedi abilities who could get spun into an, another series. Or when you look at, um, uh, on the other side of the Marvel side, the way that they've been handling those miniseries as sort of interstitial material between movies. So, yeah. you know, there's really, really a lot of creative energy there uh, 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 going through. So I think it's going to be really, really cool. I mean, <laughs> and really, I can't wait. I remember when the, when the first of the new movies came out, a friend had gotten me into a screening on the Thursday night it got released. And it was like three hours before I had to get on a plane to go back to New England for Christmas. Uh, and that in that in uh, that first scene where an X-Wing comes in over a, over a lake yeah. and there's lake effects coming off, I gasped out loud. Uh, you know, I mean, and, and that is the magic of movies. And I'm just looking for for the new X-Wing film to be just chock full of that same sort of magic. So mm, that's cool. cool. Yeah. That'd be sweet if they put in a, a Jedi character in there or something. Were you, were you ever approached to work on the film or to consult on the film or anything like that? Having written so many words and prose about this world and these, and these types of characters specifically, did they ever approach you to, uh, to work on the film or anything like that? Um, I, I have not been approached yet, uh, so I don't know if that if that will ever happen. It doesn't really surprise me because I'm not known as a uh, I'm not known for doing film work, uh, so I'm not known for for writing scripts and stuff like that. Who cares? You know the source yeah. material. You created it. Yes and no. Uh, I think that there are a lot of times when creators, if you will, moving to a new medium. Um, don't know when to let go, you know, okay. don't know when to make it the best for that medium. Uh, and I would much rather have uh, something, someone else's vision appear on screen that's not 100% aligned with mine if it's going to make a great movie, you know, if it's going to be right for that medium. Now, what would, would I love it if they come to me and say, hey, you know, we're going to have to do a novelization of this movie. You know, you got time to write the book. Um, right, I'd be right. happy to do that or do, do comic adaptations. I'm, what, that would be cool. You said something very interesting there. And, and it, for me, it just it rings up these, this image of the delta between a novel and a film. What do you think for you is that delta, that distinction between what makes a good novel versus what makes a good film. Okay, uh, films and comics are a graphic storytelling medium. So you're always gonna be on the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. In novels, you can be on the inside looking out. Mm, like okay, in a, in a movie, we have to rely on the tone of voice and the expression of the actor to tell us what's going on between their ears. Okay, in a novel, we know what's going on between their ears we just now have to interpret what's going on between everybody else's ears because we can't see that. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a different, um, it's a different vector into what's going on in the story. And, and I mean, I love doing novels and I love being inside a character's head, but boy, I also love the heck out of doing the, the graphic novels and, and working with an artist to make sure that we were seeing everything, you know, I would come up with the, with the quick quips and stuff like that to get all of this stuff across because we couldn't do the dot, dot, dot thought balloon. Uh, and right. certainly can't do that in the way that you get that input in a novel. Did, did you, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead, dear. 
that's a really profound way of explaining it. I never really thought of it like that. I just kind of felt that was the same. Um, we have the same um, thoughts on that, especially with the novels, according to the movies, like, for example, Return of the Jedi novel, there's a whole part in there where Palpatine's spitting lightning at him. And Luke is like, what the heck is this? Why didn't Yoda teach me about this? Why didn't he tell me about this? He, he puts his hand up and actually ends up deflecting one or two of the bolts. And then, of course, it takes over him. And then, of course, with the Revenge of the Sith novel and so much beyond that, there's so many inner monologues that these characters have that we don't get to learn about or see in the films that sure. enhance the story tenfold if we just like got one little glimpse of what was in the book. So I almost feel like what you as an author do is so much more um, important, I, I guess I could say, than the people making the movies because you are the one that's carrying the entire pace and the thought and you're directing what these characters are doing just, you know, on paper. And you're giving them the instructions on how to move their face or how to how to have a certain reaction or this and that. So I really I think, you know, authors in a sense, uh, you know, people really glorify the movie producers and this and that. But I think authors are uh, should be seen as just just as high up there, if not higher, because you, what you guys are doing is you're building a better story, in my opinion. Well, I think, look, think of it as as uh, an orchestra performing a work. Yeah. Um, you know, the writers are the woodwinds, uh, you know, the, the graphic artists are the strings, you know, somebody else is a brass, somebody else is going to be the, uh, going to be whatever the one a percussion. I left that out. Um, nice. you know, and, and these things, these instruments can be magical on their own and mm -hmm. just their section can tell a great chunk of the story, but the story becomes so much more when they're all incorporated together. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, go, doing having the voiceovers and having that internal dialogue is great for somebody who's watched the film and is going to go back and watch the film again, but have a chance to read the book and and let the book inform what they're seeing on the screen. Um, so I think you're going to get a good experience out of all of these things. You get a great experience when you put all of them together. Um, right. Out of curiosity. Um, is there a Star Wars book that you did not write that you read and it made you a little jealous? We we always talked about that at Rockstar Games, uh, the games that make us jealous. And we knew that those were the games that we could learn the most from. Was there ever a Star Wars novel that you read aside from your own that made you just a little jealous because, man, this is damn dope? I don't. Um, jealousy is kind of is an emotion I really don't do. Okay. Uh, all, right. Be, all right, so so because, re replace the, jealousy for your analog. The reason the reason I, the reason I don't do jealousy is because there's nothing good comes out of it, right? Um, right. you know when I read the, the when I read the Tim Zahn when I read the Thrawn trilogy, yeah, yeah. Um, you know I I mean I knew that that Tim was setting an incredibly high bar, mm -hmm. that he had been unbelievably careful in doing his research. He was absolutely spot on. You know. And, and I was lucky enough that his vision of characters agreed with my vision of the characters so that our work was going to seem uh, seamless, seem very, very compatible, uh, like it would all work together. And, and that's why doing collaborations with him, you know, absolutely worked. So from reading Tim's books, you know, I was able to pick out a lot of the bones that have got to go into a Star Wars novel. Uh, and, and that was really, really important. I mean, I never would have gotten the X-Wing books, never would have been the X-Wing books if I hadn't had his skeleton say, okay, that's how we're doing it for the Magnificent Seven. That's how we're doing it for the main yeah. characters. Now, here are the changes I've got to adapt to be doing it for the, you know, for the, for the utility infielders. Uh, you know, this is, this is what I have to do. And, and that's why the stuff worked. And we knew that, that, you know, his job was to continue what we had seen on the screen. My job was to do military science fiction in that universe. So there were military science fiction. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, there were some 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 changes had to be made and some adjustments had to be made. But bang, there we have it. You know, and then and then I think we get really cool stuff like in in, in the Endocritus trap when I'm able to bring Luke in. You know, that's yeah. where that's where the major characters, you know, come down into play. <laughs> Play with play with the bullpen. 
Uh, so we we had Matt Stover on last week, and um, he spoke very highly of you. And you guys work together uh, in the new Jedi Order. Is that what it's called? Theory. The uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I, I love Matt. I love Matt's work. Um, and uh, you know, his books came. Uh, uh, his stuff came after mine did. Uh, but uh, but uh, he was, and a number of the writers who came after my stuff did were very courteous. Uh, and, and though they did not need to, you know, called me up and said, you know, I'm thinking about doing this. You know, do you think that would work? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, that's and nice. That was, yeah, it really was, and and that was you know, and that was the same. You know, I did the same thing with Kevin, with uh, uh, you know, the tail end of I Jedi, and and Tim and I throwing stuff back and forth. Uh, you know, it was all of us who've got a lot of respect for each other, and being able to use somebody else's material very much of an honor. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you want to make sure that you got it right. You got to want to make sure that they're happy. I love that, man. The collaboration between uh, all these great minds and, and authors is yeah. pretty cool. Um, let me tweak Mark's question a little bit. And I know we're, we're coming up on time, uh, so you want to be respectful of your time here. If there's a, let's say there's a story that you they didn't uh, contract you to make or write, what is a story that you would want to make in Star Wars going forwards or a book? That's, that's a really good question. I mean, I... I on, on one level, it would be a lot of fun to play with, uh, play around in the in the uh, in the Mandalorian uh, subsection of the universe. You know, just just creating a character that would, uh, you know, run in that same strata and and play around. I, I I think that that would I would enjoy enjoy doing that a lot. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those things when you're writing in somebody else's universe. Um, I. I don't spend too much brain sweat on thinking about what I would like to do until somebody comes and says, hey, you know, we want you to do a book for us. Because uh, one, they generally have some input on, on what they want done. But two, um, you know, when they say, hey, we want to use you, that's, the, you know, that's my permission to go ahead, read absolutely everything, you know, figure out what I want to play with and go from there. Uh, and I and I don't want to be hampered by having a preconception and going, oh yeah, I just have to bend this here and jam that there to make it work. No, right, yeah. I'd really do something brand new and 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 go nuts. Yeah, that, that's oh, cool. the, that's that's very zen of you, and I appreciate that. There's a saying I don't know who I attribute it to, but if you're living in the past, you're always depressed. If you're living in the future, you're always stressed. To live in the present is the only place to find peace. Um, and uh, it seems like you carry a lot of that in your life, and I appreciate that. It's uh, it's it's inspiring. Well, thanks. You just described Anakin, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> the only place the only place he wasn't was in the present. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. That's a, yeah. First of all, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. So, look, um, we want to make sure that our audience out there, we love you guys. Thank you for supporting Rule of Two, um, and making this show possible to bring guys, um you know, like, like Michael on Michael, is there anything that you want to get to the fans out there? I, I, I know you have a new book coming out. Do you want to chat about that a little bit more? Well, the, the gears of war novels coming out uh, sometime later this year, uh, a, uh, uh, a dark souls novel uh, will be coming out. Uh, oh, people love that game. I've never played it, but people are obsessed with that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure when that book is coming out, but it'll be released in Japan and here. Oh, uh, nice. I think roughly the same time. And I think the only other thing is I have a Patreon project like absolutely everybody else. So please uh, shout it out, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, you Patreon slash Michael A. Stackpole. I think. I think that's what it Patreon is. Patreon.com slash yep. Michael A. Stackpole. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Cool. And um, I know that a lot of the listeners to Rule of Two, and we we love you and appreciate you. A lot of you guys are also users of StarWarsTheory.com, which is basically been like my passion project it's been so much fun to work on this site theory and i made a site that is actually built on top of the blockchain um, oh. and it, it and it allows users to actually generate income based on their content um through through blockchain technology and stuff like that it's a lot of fun we're going to be making some big announcements about that coming up very very soon um we're just expanding it and making it bigger so be sure to go to starwarstheory.com and, and check that out very cool. And, 
keep the discussion going on with Michael's books. Let me know which one is your favorite, and uh, hopefully he'll write some more very soon for Star Wars. Yeah. Theory, I have an idea that I'm going to say on the show right now, yeah, and what? I have I haven't talked about this with anybody, but I'm going to will this into existence. Okay, uh -huh. and and Michael, you're the first person to hear this. It's a brainstorm, but that's this show got me wanting to brainstorm more. So we've had three Star Wars writers on the podcast within the last few months, uh, Alan Dean Foster, Stover, and yourself. Right. I'd love the idea of doing almost like a panel with all three of you guys um, as part of Rule of Two. That we, you know, we're breaking all the rules, um, but it'd be so much fun to get you guys all together at the same time talking with our audience and just because like theory and I get so much, I think out of talking with the writers, you know, because like, I it, enjoy it. The, the, I mean, I enjoyed speaking to all, you know, all the Academy award winners too, but, but something with the writers, I, I feel I have, I have more to talk about. I mean, I'm not an Academy award winner. I'm just a nerd. <laughs> I'm just a star Wars fan. Like, yeah. you know, so it's like, it, it's great to talk to you guys. Cause I feel like i I'm a fan of your work, you know, in, in, in a different sense than I am with the others. So well, thanks. And, and I, you know, I, I, I think that would be a lot of fun too. Uh, both of those guys are great guys. Um, yeah. I, I had to say, you know, pretty much across the board, all of the star Wars authors I've interacted yeah. with are a lot of fun. So. And next bring Tim week Zone on here too. Next week, we do have another Academy award winner for star Wars coming on the show. And I can't, you know, I can't wait for that. We had Dennis Murin on the show, Paul Hirsch on the show, mm -hmm. and me as a film student, somebody who went to NYU who actually got to learn that craft. I just nerd out so much talking to these guys who invented the craft that I studied. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of fun. But anyway, guys, thank you so much for this. And Theory, give me give me one. Just rise, my friend. <laughs>